Tonight's episode of Late Night Playset is brought to you by St. Clair Insurance. They say all that separates men and boys is the coverage for their toys. St. Clair Insurance has coverage for your toys. Coverage for your toys.com. Yeah, all right. Here we are. Welcome back. Hello at home. Uh, welcome back to the Late Night Playset. My name is Jay Ryan. We are here this evening. It is Thursday. Tonight is 9.17. It's kind of a cool thing for our guest who we have here tonight. Spike Ferriston is here for our September 17th show, 2020. He's not actually here. He's here via Zoom, but uh, he looks just like that. He's got a whole setup over there. Hi, Spike. How are you? I'm good, man. Uh, basically, I have been looking forward to this for a heck of a long time. Uh, we are sort of throwing out the rest of our show. I just want to talk to you for the hour, assuming uh, you're good with that. Um, I kind of want to touch on all the stuff. Our guest this evening is Spike Ferriston. You know him from, uh, gosh, he was a writer on uh, Letterman, SNL, um, Seinfeld, for goodness sake, a little show called Seinfeld. Uh, I found him when he had a show called Ma uh, Car Matchmaker. And uh, I bought all those seasons on iTunes when I found it. I was totally addicted. I thought it was great. And uh, we have uh, become a little bit of car buddies lately uh, up in the mountains and certainly in Malibu. And uh, I want to talk to him about <laughs> his whole career and certainly how he turned it into cars at the end uh, here. Not the end of his career, but uh, most currently. Spike, thank you so much for doing our little show here, buddy. I really, really appreciate it. Are you David Letterman? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were Jay. You look like David Letterman. You're talking like David Letterman right now. I can't even help it. I feel, you know, it's funny. I notice Should that I with get you my sometimes. Blue, blue Letterman mug out so I can be like you. Oh, geez. That is, now you told me, is that the, is that the actual deal right there? It's what you have on your desk. Yeah, this is the last, uh, the mug from the last show on NBC. But that's that's really, I mean, these are just blue mugs. You have an actual Dave mug, right? I don't think there's any difference in them. <laughs> what does it say on the bottom of yours? <laughs> Made in China, I'm pretty walk, sure. Walk, walk, walk your back, Spain. So these coffee mugs Dave used were Spanish. <laughs> I blame GE. And inside is a little piece of paper that, that says, uh, because I will die, I'm sure, soon, and no one will know what any of this stuff is. But it says, don't throw this away. This is David Letterman's uh, mug from the last NBC show. <laughs> it might <laughs> when be the worth family, 20 bucks. For when the family's YouTube. going through the stuff? I mean, eBay. Yeah. Um, Spike, I, I don't know where to start with you. I have, can I, I just have, I've got so many questions for you. Go ahead. Take it over. Do, do, you, do, do the people watching this understand... Like what this desk is and how this gets started. And, uh, you know, that's uh, before I knew you, I remember seeing this on YouTube and going, where, what is that guy doing with what appears to be Dave's real desk and chairs? Yep. Yet he's doing a car podcast. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can help me with that, Mr. Writer. <laughs> help me it tell doesn't this have damn to story. make sense. <laughs> what I just, you know, why not just do a, a late night show? You've got the desk. Uh, I do. Um, are they just giving those out these days? Can you just get one? I'd love to just get one. No, you do it from right there. You, you get everything you need. Well, all right. I mean, I feel like that's kind of what I'm... I guess, I guess you're right. We've turned it into a podcast of late. In the beginning, we were trying to do kind of a, a variety-ish type show when you could have people here and we had performances and <laughs> yoga demonstrations and stuff. This looks like a TV show. Uh, that's and all it, I really know it, how to do, man. It's, real, it's literally all I know how to do. Let's see where I am. It does not look like a TV show. This is a, a guy sitting above his garage. <laughs> That's what this is right here. Did you? All right. Can, can we? Uh, I, I want to start. Like, I wanted to kind of go in order, but I guess it doesn't really matter. I, I really want to know about your talk show. Your It was called Talk Show, wasn't it? With Spike Ferriston? Yes. Can are you getting the same delay I'm getting? Or can you? Are we hearing each other in real time? Because right now it sounds like to me that I'm talking to you in the space station. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm watching your lips You're, move and the audio matches it for me. Yeah, I go like this and then a minute later I see myself do that. 
but I just want to make sure that you're hearing me in real time. Yeah, on our side, it looks okay. I apologize for the delay okay, on yours. Um, and I, I might just uh, shrink my window down here because it's throwing me up. All right. Where, where, I'm listening. Let me start with this. Where are you from? How did you end up at 30 Rock? I know how I got there, but how did you get to 30 Rock? Um, I was an intern. Um, you see, that's the echo. I'm, I'm, I think I'm just hearing your echo. Is that? It's going to make me crazy. <laughs> Is there any reason why I should be hearing myself echoing in your studio? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll turn my TV down. Maybe it's that. Listeners at home, turn your turn your radios down. Yeah, it could be that. Is it any better? That's a little better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounded like one of those echoey cell phone phone calls where you say something and then you listen to yourself say it again. But now I think we have it. Perfect. Look at you. Um, I was an intern, and I was a uh, via a being a bartender in Boston. I met someone who was dating someone on uh, the Letterman show, and that person uh, got me an interview to be an intern on the show. And before I knew it, I was commuting from Boston to New York, interning in the um, graphics department for Saturday Night Live and Letterman. That's where it all started. Oh, so was it was it the same for you then? Were you uh, sort of shared among the shows? Because I technically worked for NBC, not the actual shows. So I was kind of like everywhere. I was wherever they put me, basically. Were you a page? Uh, I wasn't. I was doing... <laughs> do, do you not know this part about me, too? My school... I was a terrible I student, no, so no. my school set up, like, these internships and, like, work-study programs, and the, the first year was my junior year. I started at the local TV station in Connecticut and learned the ways of the world there, and then the next year was senior year. I worked at 30 Rock during the day. So um, I technically, uh -huh. I guess I was like an apprentice. Technically, I was in the apprentice program because uh, at the end of it, they basically wanted me to join the union and become an audio guy there at 30 Rock, <laughs> which is what I think they kind so of were, what were you? So do. tell me what you were doing. Were you working on individual shows? Like, did you work on Donahue or? On, yeah, no, Donahue know, the, had just, it was, it was there and it was just leaving and Rosie O'Donnell was coming in to take <laughs> over that show or that set rather. And uh, right. I did work on that, and um, and that is where I actually met Daniel Kellison when he was running that show. Right, right. But wow. that was what, so. But when, what, oh, go ahead. So, but you were working audio, so you were in the studio while these shows were shooting. Yeah, yeah. I was literally in the oh, room cool. and um, generally uh, on the floor, uh, like helping with cable stuff uh, for the boom. Or um, sometimes right. I would get to like mi you know mic a guest or whatever. It was basically a second assistant audio position. Wow, that's a great job. Do you remember, and not many people do, but do you remember the announcer's lounge that was mm. kind of on the right side of the main floor when you'd walk over? There was a, one big lounge, and it was on, filled on the eighth with floor? Don. No, I think it was on the second floor or even the first floor. It, when you came in from 6th Avenue, if you went right, there, oh, that's funny. And where, where Howard Stern studio used to be, Right down from there was a room that said announcer studio, NBC announcer studio. And in there would be Don Pardo and like oh seven God. other announcers warming up every morning going Poughkeepsie, Tallahassee. <laughs> you know, it was just an amazing, you know, I had never worked in television before and it was like a cartoon. You know, you go to the announcer's lounge and there they all are. And there's Don Pardo and they're going, oh, ho, ho, okay. Saturday Night Live. Yeah, and they were I, all practicing their lines and getting ready. And I just thought, you know, it was such a – it's just TV isn't like that anymore. But 30 Rock is this was this unique little biosphere of everything in TV. And, yeah. Um, I try to try to, I try to explain that to other people. It really was like the, the end of the studio system almost. It was like right. you, you had a career in that building. If you got a job in that building, you worked there for 40 years until you didn't work anymore. Right. And NBC was privately owned, I believe. This is all before General Electric owned it and Whoa. entertainment became like corporatized. So it was its own groovy thing, you know, much cooler than it is now. <laughs> when you were there, it was uh, it was it was already GE. It was already GE. That happened in the 80s, I think. Right. No, it was not. I was there before GE. Really? I remember the switch. No kidding. Yes. So you were there when they got rid of, AB, uh, of NBC Radio and all that shit? Yes. Wow. I couldn't believe that a corporate business entity, because when I was young, I just knew I can't. There are two things I'm not going to be able to do. Um, 
I won't be able to join the military. I have a lot of relatives in the military, but I won't be able to follow the rules. I can't. I had problems with authority, and I knew if I went in there, it's going to be bad for the military. And you're going to pick not the freaking work. thing apart, sure. And I couldn't wrap my head around regular business either. And you know, luckily, found my way into entertainment, which I thought this is you know, it's it's like music, which I love, but there's you know, it's kind of self-contained. You're not on the road. You're not touring. It's right. It's uh, and it, I, I, it resonated with me a little more being, a, you know, working on a show like Saturday Night Live rather than being up on stage playing in a band. So, you know, my first year as an intern there, it was, you know, it's wild. There were still the remnants of Saturday Night Live that I had grown up on, like, you know, Belushi's Coke dealer. I met him. You know, there were That's there were so people, funny. the people you I had there at the grown changing up of the watching, guards, like a cast wise or anything. It was Phil Hartman's first year and, and Dana oh, wow. Carvey and John Lovitz. And, but I had grown up watching, you know, I remember my dad waking me up going, you got to watch this new show. So, you know, I must've been 11 years old. Um, I forget what year SNL starts, but i have been watching it since its beginning. So, you know, again, for me, this, these were just people I had seen on TV and I hadn't really seen anybody on TV. And then, you know, by the time I got there, people I had read about, I'd read the Saturday, Saturday Night Live biography. And it was kind of fascinating to be inside of it. It was dreamlike for me and very vivid and very, um, uh, very wonderful in such a, you know, corporatized building. The building looks like a giant office building, but it's all fun and games and entertainment and comedy. And I absolutely loved it. So by the time I get to Letterman, it's somewhere in there in the, in the 90s that GE, I believe, buys NBC because things kind of changed overnight <laughs> there were right. you know there were forms for office supplies oh gosh. there were all of these like office things that for me personally it was really depressing it was really depressing that now i was in a corporatized business now of course all entertainment is corporatized and it you know lurches slowly like an iceberg and no one you know show or anything can affect it it's too giant but right. back then, you know, it kind of was rock and rollish. It was, and it was neat to kind of be there at least for a year or two of that, and and see it. Do you, I mean? Do you think the building was? Do you th again? I, I consider that a heck of a changeover. You know, I mean, I'm sure that building probably was a little more buttoned up when Johnny was there or whatever versus <laughs> '80s New York when Dave came in and sort of poked, you know, pulled the curtain back on the whole place and, and yeah. Showed us well, the hallways and everything that we used to sort of started pushing. Right. I mean, that was fun to have corporate overlords that we didn't like and Dave could push back against. Um, that's I mean, part of that what made me love the show situation? with him. Not for a late night show. You know, what, what I love about late night is it talks about everything that's kind of going on in the host life, in the show's life, and then out in the world. And... You know, back then and in normal days, entertainment, you know, that the, we don't have a political situation like we have right now that dominates the news day and night. And you can do shows based on just what happened in the first few hours of it. Back right. then, news was kind of boring, right? There wasn't even a lot of tabloid. There's no TMZ. So <laughs> the show would turn in on itself. And, and what I loved about Dave was that group of interns because I was young. It was my first year of college. And I was so jealous that he not only had interns, like what a great internship, but that they, he was putting those interns on television. Like yeah. that to me was like, that is how I have to, this is where I need to be. I don't know why, but I need to be one of those interns and I need to be working for this guy whose comedy I feel is the only thing that's making me laugh these days. Like it really, it hit me like a lightning bolt. Like this is where I need to be. There's nothing else that I'm interested in. It almost like you, and I know your story, it becomes an obsession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, right? Uh, yeah, it sure did for, I mean, I mean, you could certainly <laughs> one could draw, the, draw the parallels to currently for sure. Well, I, I can relate to that. I can relate to that because, you know, we, uh, before I met this woman who got me the internship, the previous year I had my roommate at Berkeley College of Music was uh, from New York or knew someone in New York. And he said, hey, let's I can get us Letterman tickets. Would you ever want to go to that? And I was like, yeah. my God, yes. 
And a, a few months later, we had tickets. And, we, you know, we're in Boston right there on Mass Ave at Berkeley. And I made a bet with some of the guys in the dorm. I said, look, I will get on the show tonight, watch it at 1230. They're like, what oh. are you talking about? I don't know how I'm going to do it. Oh. But let's let's uh, put some money down on the table. I'm going to get on the screen, but watch the whole show. If I don't find an organic opening, I'm going to find an inorganic opening, somewhat like you did, right? And so we get into the audience. I'm really I'm in the back of the audience I'm with my friend Jeff, and he's like, are you really going to do this? I go, I don't know what I'm going to do. I had this really lame 80s like chess king blazer that I remember was like white and black and red, really bad 80s fashion. Um, and Dave comes out to warm up the audience and he goes, all right. He goes, I don't know if today's uh, uh, Canadian holiday. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody here from Canada. Is there anybody here from Canada? And I raised my hand and two other people did. And he goes, okay, you four people, you're from Canada. You're sure? Because tonight we're going to do something special. I only want you four people to come up when I hand out the lyrics to O Canada. Right? <laughs> and so Dave does the monologue. He sets everything up. I've never seen the clip. I, I lived I lived in fear that Dave would find this out when I was writing on the show. He sets, <laughs> uh, sets up the bit and he goes, okay, Canadians, come on up. And I walked right up on stage and turned and grabbed it and mugged for the camera for a second and won the bet. Wow. And but that wasn't, didn't happen and, all that. That was not a, that was a, I mean, you made that happen. That was How the hell did luck. that happen? That, I was a very lucky human back then. I remember things worked out for me just through sheer determination or obsession. Yeah. They don't anymore, but they did. Um, and it, you know, it didn't kind of scratch the itch. It made things much worse <laughs> because wow. I'd seen, I was like, boy, the studio's small. I've never been in the television studio. I really like everything that's happening here. And, you know, I just started basically just dreaming about trying to get an inter internship on the show. I was a bartender during the day to pay for college and I was going to Berkeley College of Music. Frankly, I wasn't very into it and I wasn't uh, very focused. But this thing was always in the back of my head. And I was in, you know, English classes at Berkeley College of Music, focusing on my writing, music writing and just, uh, you know, regular writing and not even worried about anything music wise other than production. So um, when that moment came and this woman, Harriet, walked into Legal Seafoods where I bartended wearing the Letterman varsity jacket, I, I nearly tackled her. And I yeah. said, where did you get that? <laughs> She goes, what? Where did you get the jacket? She goes, I just, uh, my boyfriend works for the show. You're kidding. And I said, can you get me one? That was my first stupid question. She goes, no, they're not going to give you one of those. I said, okay, forget, forget that. Can you get me an internship? And she goes, yeah, the guy's still in love with me. I'm sure he'd do me that favor, but what's your name? Are you going to introduce yourself? Wow. <laughs> and I said, I was sorry. You know, I, I'm uh, Mike, the bartender, Michael. I didn't have the nickname Spike yet. Um, and she said, well, Mike, I'm going to call him up and I'm going to get you an internship. Very sweet. And, uh, you know, she's single-handedly responsible for this career in entertainment that I have. That is absolutely amazing. Someone Wild you didn't story, know who it? walked into a restaurant. I know. Well, she ended up, she was just hired to be a, um, she was a model and she was also just hired to be a hostess. She kind of was, I guess, was pulling a geographic after this bad New York relationship and tired of modeling and um she ended up doing that years later i caught up with her she ended up being david working for david mamet so she uh and i and david mamet turns out to be down at santa monica airport with a hanger across from mine and a porsche guy so when i meet him when i didn't know i'm meeting david mamet i go hi he goes hi i go nice play and he goes oh you like porsches oh yeah we're talking about porsche he goes yeah. i go what's your name we go david they go glenn gary glenn ross david are you david mamet he goes yeah he goes do you know harriet he goes Harriet of Harriet's instrumental in, you know, making my career. And, you know, what Holy it's cow. an amazing little, isn't that wild? It is. I'll tell you, backing up to NBC, though, just for a second, because that's what I do. Your story really parallels mine a lot. I was a musician when I was growing up. I don't, you didn't say, did you, did you say where your instrument was? I was, I play guitar and trumpet and, but I was writing, it was music scoring and production engineering, working the boards and doing all that stuff. Wow. But so you had an understanding of theory and everything, obviously. 
There was two intense years of that. Yeah. 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 They they when you go to Berkeley, I don't know if they do it now, but they sit you down and on the first day they play you a song and it's a complex jazz song. And they say in two years, we will be able to play this once and you will be able to write down all the parts. And you go, There's no fucking way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> At the end of two years, it's not easy. They play one note, they play a C note, and you can do it. You write everything out. It's amazing. Well, but so while you and then it all, and then you forget all of it. While you didn't follow that application, though, it does seem like it figure it it almost trained your brain how to how to deconstruct. Does I mean doesn't that I, help I you in your joke more, writing? No, I found oh. the more I learned about music, the less I enjoyed it. And nothing against musicians, and maybe you know maybe you feel this way, but it sometimes it's like hanging out with baseball players. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really you know a group of the smartest humans that you're around and you know i would have been the techie guy i would have been the nerdy techie guy working the board and i wasn't quite happy with that either i like to i'm more, i found that i wanted to write something it at the time it was music um but now it's you know it's this stuff tv entertainment movies but wait so what's your music history Oh, nothing. I was just going to, well, thank you for getting back to it. I was going to say that I was, that my thing was I was going to be a musician. Uh, my dad got me a drum set when I was like one, uh, like, well, I think I got my first snare drum when I was like one and a half, whatever that Christmas was. And I got a drum set the next year and not like a Muppet drum set, like an actual drum set. And, uh, and they had me taking lessons from when I was really young. So it really seemed like that was going to be the path. I was probably going to go to like M Musicians Institute or the new school, something like that. Something trendy mm -hmm. and hip <laughs> in my mind. Uh, the one thing was I'm a horrible student, so I, I never factored that in. Uh, but but where it comes to the parallel with you is all of that changed when I went on the NBC studio tour and was actually in those rooms for the first time and felt that energy and that magic. And then I said, nope, this is where I need to be, period. And then yeah, I they literally have all you know, manifested that same thing. I stopped doing anything and everything else while I concentrated on that. And uh, and and somehow it, it worked out. It happened. Part of it is the uh, security. They hold you back. They make you wait. You have to wait at those elevators. Mm. <laughs> and then you go up and then you see it happening and you're being held off and you see a famous person or two in the hallway. It's it's uh, you're right about that. It's almost like what makes a great comedy club is a small room with brick walls and being dark that is one of the greatest television buildings I've ever been into. You know, the lack of space, the small studios, four different studios on one floor. And, yeah. you know, suddenly there's Dan Rather walking down the hall and you see the people you just saw in the morning on the Today Show going up to do a spot on Letterman. It, it's, it's amazing. It's really addicting. And then, then the way the whole, whole building transforms on Friday night and Saturday night for Saturday Night Live. For eighth floor, A whole yeah. different thing happens. And... You, yeah, you're jamming at one till one in the morning and spilling out of there too. It's, you know, you got it's a young man's game for sure, but it is, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uncut heroin is what I like to say. <laughs> if you like entertainment, <laughs> it's uh, hardcore. Well, and you know what? It's when wonderful. that show, oh, I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off. When that show went uh, to, when they left NBC to go to CBS, there was a party in the studio at the end of, uh, uh, at the end of the run, and I, I mm -hmm. believe you were there for that, right? Yeah. In 6A? Yeah. yeah. Yep. That supposedly that is when Glenn Arbor told me that the NBCA uh, audio crew gave this microphone to Dave or Lori or Marty or whoever would have taken it. That at the mic. Time, right. Right. Uh, to, 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 to bring with them to the theater. And, uh, and I heard that they uh, took his guest or his, uh, his, his, whatever, his desk chair and maybe even the guest chairs. And supposedly those might even be them. I don't know. Kathleen's dead, so I can't Well, that's ask where I had, that was the night I got this. That's yeah. where I yanked that off the desk. And then I, I think there's something up in the wall. Oh, we all have little, they give you a bunch of stuff. That, so I think the ticket from the last night, they gave us one of those oh, sealed nice. in glass or something. It's up on my thing there. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like leaving what was arguably one of the biggest shows on television at the time to go to what was for sure the biggest show on television for at least a, a good run there? What was that like? I mean, to, to go from, and then, and then you did it again later, but we'll stick with Letterman for a sec. <clears throat> you know, there's a moment 
um, before the decision is made, where I believe Dave has been offered the time slot after Leno and told that Leno is uh, only going to be on, in that spot for a year and then you'll get it. I believe that was the deal offered, but Bill Carter could correct me if I'm wrong. And the decision Dave was making, take that deal with NBC and stay on or go to CBS, right? And there was a period of time, I remember, where Dave was just radio silent to everybody, including us. No, nobody knew what he was going to decide. And we had an office, a writer's room office, uh, not directly across from Dave, but maybe one office down from Dave. He was on the corner, and then you walked a few feet, and then we had a conference room right there. And frequently at night, you would find us all in there trying to come up with an idea for the next day's show, right? <laughs> Under a lot of pressure, but having fun and, you know, fooling around. And Steve O'Donnell or uh, Rob Burnett, the head writer, would we'd pitch him ideas. He'd go in. He'd come back exasperated. No, Dave's upset or this. Yes, that's good. We're going to do this. <laughs> so um, w either Steve or Rob went in there to pitch Dave and um, uh, Tom Broca just suddenly walks into the room and he goes, uh, hey, uh, hey, guys, how you doing? <laughs> like, hey, Tom Broca, he walks in our room. What are you doing? He goes, oh. I was just back from, uh, I do a terrible broker. I don't have it's a not awful. Back from, uh, yeah, I'm back from, I just got back from Africa. There was some conflict going on in Africa. And he's like, uh, you know, we landed. I, we were like, how did you get there? I mean, there's a war going on. It's like, well, we, we landed here on this part of the country. We drove for a day. Then we took another, like a little puddle jumper here over this river. And then we landed in the middle of nowhere in this village. And it was dark. So we decided to just walk into this this group of villagers. We didn't know if they were hostile or not. And just ask them if we could just spend the night uh, in their tents. And they luckily didn't try to kill us and said it was okay. Uh, they didn't really speak English except for the chief. And so I went into the, the tent with the chief. And sat down with him and I said, I'm Tom Brokaw, I'm a newsman from uh, NBC. And the chief nodded his head and he said, so is Dave leaving NBC or is he staying? Is he going to go to CBS? <laughs> That's how big the story was. That's a true story. That's amazing. I, I did, had no idea where you were going to go with that. Wow. That's. Yeah, he said he wasn't joking. He wasn't telling us a joke. That's how big the story was, and that's how far and deeply it had saturated. And, you know, I've lived through a couple moments like that. The end of Seinfeld was like that, too, where the saturation point in culture was almost 100%. And that's how big that was. So, you know, we didn't know what was going on. And a short time later, maybe a week or two later, I was in... Um, my one of the fellow writers, uh, Donick, my buddy Donick's office. I don't know what we were doing. We were hanging there late and Warren Littlefield walked in. Nobody else was in the office. Dave was down in his office. Pr president and, of NBC uh, at the time for anybody. Else. President of NBC, Warren Littlefield, who is a terrific guy. I got to know him after and got to know him on Seinfeld and really liked him at the time. Oh, of course. Yeah, was, of course. I thought he was the devil at the time because he didn't give <laughs> Dave what he wanted. And, and Dave earned that spot and i was upset about it as we all were um and david already made the decision to go to cbs and i remember warren littlefield going around the corner and and uh donick and i had some harsh words for him we leaned out and then went oh oh shit did we just tell the president of nbc to go fuck him <laughs> but i i think we did um and that was the end of it. I, 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 I'm not sure what happened in that meeting because the decision had already been made, but maybe Bill Carter knows. But after that, you know, it was just this walk across the street to this whole new operation at the Ed Sullivan Theater. And, but so you know, squeaky it, clean and new. Everything was brand was, new for you guys. Yeah, it was different. It was a different vibe. Dave owned yeah. the whole thing. And, you know, he, we didn't have NBC to kind of... We really liked being picked on by NBC and General Electric. It gave us something to talk about and write about. And me in particular, I loved it. I thought it was great. And when we were going doing this other thing with a friendly network, that was okay too. It just wasn't as fun, right? <laughs> like I yeah. really, at the time, was a very rebellious personality and to have something up to fight against, I loved it. It kind of tapped into this, you know, the anger that kind of drove my comedy and it was fun. Um, and CBS was fun in its own way. It just was not, it just was not, it never the same for me. Well, is that, 
<laughs> but then you went back to NBC. Did you? And you, I can't imagine on Seinfeld you had any of those experiences. But you did. You were dealing with probably all the same people. Yeah, but that was a different. That was a wholly uh, a different idea. I mean, I, 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 you know, I stayed on with Letterman right through the London shows. Uh, you know, one year because it was the only show I wanted to write for. I stayed one year longer than I wanted to, just in case I was wrong and I shouldn't leave. So I, I wrote there for five years, and then. It really just became about, you know, wanting a non-city, non-apartment life. I love really? cars. I like dogs. And I wanted a backyard. And I didn't want to live in a box anymore. And I had done nine in Boston and nine years, I think, in, or a bunch of years, in, almost 10 years in New York and a bunch of years in Boston. And I wanted a yard. We would go out there for the Emmys. And I'd look around L.A. and go, this is great. Right. This is exactly what I want. I want a convertible. Um, I want to smoke cigars in that convertible and drive on this famous Sunset Boulevard. Right. I want to hike, and I want to sit in my backyard. <laughs> it was like that. That though, that's how I made that decision. So I just I quit. I just quit and moved to, to L.A. Wow, that and was literally on I'd here. Why it, did you leave? That's amazing. Yeah, huh. I wanted. I just wanted uh, a different life for myself outside of that. Which I don't know. It seems like the millennials get credit for wanting to have life outside of work, but I, you know, back then there, it seems like that's something you do when you're young. <laughs> you don't want to spend all day long in an office. So, um, you know, I was just thrilled to be in this warm climate um, and get a well, car. The they brought the show. They brought the show out here a couple times, so you would have been with it. Oh then, yeah, yeah, right. In the no, first couple of years, and yeah, they were yeah. doing it, I think, from TV City, right? From yes. the nice big studios. Yeah. No, uh, we had a lot of, and, and and that's where you know, that very first year, two weeks into getting hired, Dave goes, "I hear you like cars." I don't even remember how he heard this, and I had never really spoken to Dave other than hello. And he goes, "Come out to Santa Monica Airport. I want you to drive my cars." And it was a terrifying prospect for a human being like myself, who is quite insecure at the time, <clears throat> but also kind of terrified of, you know, a Lauren Michaels and David Letterman. These are comedy gods to me. I don't even want to interact with them. I, I don't have what it takes to sit down and have a conversation with them at a time. <clears throat> so the idea of driving his cars was exciting, but terrifying. Yeah. Um, so we fly out on a Friday night. He goes, come out to the airport Saturday morning and uh, just ring the bell or call me. I, he had a hard line phone. And I go, you're going to be there? He goes, yeah, I sleep there. I have a cot and a bathroom in this hangar that opens up like this with a padlock at it. I went, okay, Dave, <clears throat> Howard Hughes, um, that's normal. Um, and I didn't know much about cars at that point. I just knew I liked to drive them. And... Uh, I rang the buzzer that rang his hangar there. And uh, like he said, all I hear is a, yeah. Hmm. And I'm like, fuck. I think he said to show up at nine in the morning. And I go, it's uh, it's Spike. It's the new writer. And he goes, what the fuck do you want? <laughs> and I go, ah, uh, well, you go, I'm kidding, Spike. Come in. And then he's just breaking you in, Spike. <laughs> But that that's where I stayed. He he knocked me off balance. I stayed there for a few years, actually. <clears throat> and then he opens up this hangar door, and in there is a four cam speedster, uh, a silver mm. 914.6, um, a, a, a red Rosso Corsa uh, Ferrari Dino. Cool. Um, many of the cool, cars man. that I ended up buying, um, a, a 60s 356. And he said, I want you to drive all of these cars um, and a bunch of Austin Healy's. But he goes, I want you to start with this 356. And he puts me in this, um, I don't remember the year, but I think it was just a plain 356B. And I go, well, how does this work? I, I'm noticing we're on a live airport. And he goes, yeah, don't go on the runway. And I go, okay. <laughs> I know you know how this works. I don't. He goes, go out." Side, I'll open the gate and just run it up and down the street, have some fun. Jeez. And, you know, as neurotic as I was, I said, well, what happens if I got hit? hit? I, he goes, don't get hit. Just drive it. So I blast down 31st Street out to Ocean Park and driving this beautiful car. I take a left on Ocean Park. I go about a half mile and the pedal, the throttle goes right to the floor and I feel the wire just go pop. 
Oh. I've got nothing. And I'm like, God damn it. I knew I should not have come here and done this. So I, I have to turn the car around and push it all the way back. There's no cell phones. We don't have cell phones. I'm just now pushing my boss's car two oh. weeks into working. And I don't quite know how he's going to react. And I push it all the way down 31st Street. I must have had help on Ocean Park. And I get to the gate and he's standing now at the gate because he's like, where the hell did this guy go? And he goes, what happened? I go, Dave, I, I don't know. I just got on the throttle, like you said, but the the, the wire to the, the engine just, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't oh. work. And he's like, oh. And we push it together to his hangar and he lifts the rear lid. And when we, we open it up, we see that his car dealer, a uh, detailer, had left rags in the throttle cable body. Oh, and no. when I had pressed down, it had pulled off. And he went, oh, well, there it is. The guy who was cleaning my car is fucked up and left the rag. So. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that's <clears throat> that's good. And then Dave goes, all right, take the Ferrari Dino out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, Spike, and let me he, put a pin goes, in it just for a second here because our, our, our yeah. stuff seems to have frozen. <laughs> left off. Sorry, everybody. We just heard a ridiculous uh, story. I... I was not familiar with about uh, Dave uh, having you drive his cars at Santa Monica Airport when you were out here one of those times. So anyway, I'm so sorry. That will all be in there, but let's pick it up from wherever. All right, you went to Seinfeld. Um, can you tell me, The Soup Nazi is an episode that you're probably most famous for writing. Why is that the episode? There are so many episodes. They're all memorable, and I know you wrote many. Why is that the one? I, I don't know. I, you know, it's one it's one of those things in comedy that you never quite know which joke or which thing that you've done is going to pop. And that just happens to be the thing that worked. I mean, I think anybody who's watched the episode might know more about it than me. But if you were to ask me, you know, <laughs> back then, is that episode going to do well? I would have said, no, I'm going to get fired when this airs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's i still don't understand what drives the uh the popularity of that one i don't who, get it. who is the real soup nazi who is that really based off of anybody we know al yegan he's he's a guy who sold soup on 55th and 8th avenue that we used to go to when we were letterman writers who does that so that so really it's a is documentary true. No, no, no. I, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, <laughs> Bill has a lot of things in his place in Malibu Kitchen that would lead one to believe that perhaps, perhaps he was the personification of at least that no, character. But that's how I met Bill. I was at his deli with Jerry and there was a woman. He was arguing with this woman and she said, you know what? You're like the deli Nazi, like the soup Nazi, but you're the deli Nazi. You know who I'm talking about? Wow. And Bill looked over her shoulder and saw Jerry there. And he goes, no, I don't, but he does. And Jerry said, he's the guy who wrote it. Oh, my God. <laughs> and the lady left. And that's how, that's how we met Bill. Come on. And we've been friends ever since. That's a, that's a fantastic story. <laughs> Holy <There> shit. <laughs> and it's true. Oh, that's amazing. Um... Can you tell us quickly uh, if there's a truncated version of it? I was telling you on the mountain, obviously, my David Letterman story. Our viewers know, but obviously mm -hmm. this microphone and the whole bit. There was a story I always heard from uh, when Seinfeld was going off the air that a part of that set went missing. And when I talked to you on the mountain, you recalled a lot of the pieces from that. And I would love to share that with uh, the audience, if you don't mind. I'm trying. You, you're going to have to remember the show. Cause I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it the intercom story. Yeah, but it's the writers from a show. So, you know, like I was saying, it was a oh, very I see. big I see. It was a very big thing to the point where people were trying to find out what the finale was going to be. So the 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 last episodes we were shooting, we'd have helicopters over us all the time trying to, you know, glean some sort of story point of what's going on. They had no idea we weren't shooting the finale. Larry was busy writing it and getting ready to shoot it, but um you know, it was right at the beginning of collectibles, and I, I think it was Jerry had the sense. Oh, here's what it was. Here's this. This is the quick sequence of events. All right. Yeah. A few months prior, 
Um, some Cuban cigars had disappeared from Tim Kaiser's office, who was one of our producers, <laughs> kind of ran the office. We couldn't figure out, or he couldn't figure out why these cigars kept disappearing. So he set up a video camera, right? Something we do all the time now. But back then, this was revolutionary. We'll hide a video <laughs> camera. And we caught these lot security guards taking expensive Cuban cigars and smoking them, right? We were all very entertained. Tim was not, and the guys got fired, whatever. Um, <laughs> So now, a few months later, it's the end of the series, and you know it's obviously so big. Jerry becomes worried about people stealing things from the set, and um, unbeknownst to I think all of us, he had cameras set up to make sure no one stole anything. And one day before we were done shooting, um, is it the intercom? Is that what disappeared? Something disappeared from his apartment. That's what I remember it being. Right. You know, you know the the buzzer to get people in the exactly. building. Exactly. Kind of like Dave's mic when Dave's microphone disappeared and it <laughs> it threw it made Jerry really mad. That's the type of thing that makes Jerry mad, right? Letterman, we could react to it and have fun with it. Here is just like he's already nervous. So suddenly there's tape and and we saw uh, some writers from a show next door come in the middle of the night and look around the set, which frankly I would have done too. I mean it's you know an iconic cool thing and why wouldn't you want to pay your last respects and yeah it may as well be the cheers bar it's absolutely iconic and i'm you know and this you know the writers took this intercom and uh off the wall and and they they caught him and you know castle rock was not happy um i can't say looking back you know again as the guy with the mug with you, the guy with the microphone, these are kindred spirits that did this. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the show. Who's the show? It was some stupid, um, it's a show I never watched, and it was a woman, newswoman, but it was the writers from that show. Um, I'll remember it when it's too late. It doesn't matter. Um, is this another sitcom? Another sitcom that was shooting. And, you know, Castle Rock really scared. I don't know who those writers are. I don't remember their names, but they said, if you don't bring this back right now, it, it was, you know, one of the only times I think I heard you will never work in show business again, Holy whether that's crap. a real threat or not. Um, and they brought it back and they apologized. And yeah, I'm trying that to think of the it. time frame. Was it Sybil? Maybe it was Sybil. It was Sybil. Was it Sybil? Yes. Yeah, Christine it. Baranski. There you go. I'm pretty um, sure it was the writers from Sybil that did it. Um, and then later on, when we had a party on the set after the last show, uh, Jerry said, take whatever you want. Gosh, <laughs> just take it. And I said, all right. And I took the cash register from the diner and a bunch of glasses. And I have, most importantly, most importantly, from Jerry's apartment, that 550 poster that's recreated. Have you no ever seen kidding. that? I have I'm trying the to think of which one it is. In the Everything in that frame. apartment seemed to be Porsche related. You can Google it and you will see it. Just know that that poster right now framed as it was in the show is hanging in my son James' bedroom. Um and, you know, that was something they were just like, we're throwing it away. So if somebody wants it, so I'm like, oh, I'll take it. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. Uh, real quick, B-movie. Yeah. Do you happen to at all remember that my wife actually was, worked a little bit on that, certainly with the press tour. And oh, she right, was repping right. uh, Chris Rock at the time. And um, so she did the international tour where you guys went around. And I don't know the details on Not this, me. but... But, but I know go? where you're going. No, this is when oh. they pushed Jerry off a building, right? Yeah, the B, the uh, the B suit and <laughs> yes. Chris Rock and the other thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we were thinking how amazing, and Jerry included, how amazing would it be if the rope broke and Jerry died in that B suit? That that was his last moment. <laughs> and Jerry was like, if that happens, it will be one of the greatest things that happens in pop culture, and I'm <laughs> fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't die, but how great would that have been? <laughs> well, I'm glad you knew at least what I was talking about. Um, the way she tells it, at least, it was a little bit more of a of an event. I mean, it, was it hot or what, did he overheat or was Chris? Chris didn't want to get in his suit or there was it seemed like there was more to it. Seeing it, too. I was doing my late night show at that point. So I was kind of just moonlighting, having fun writing with those guys. When Jerry called, you know, I was in the middle of this doing this late night show. But I said, look. You're telling me Andy Robbins going to be there and, you know, we'll have some of the other Seinfeld writers there. Yeah, whatever you want. It's it's so much fun to write with Jerry. It's one of those wow. things you just nobody knows this, but he's a really good laugher. And once you're in the room, it's OK to make mistakes and bad pitches. But when you get stuff, you're making Jerry Seinfeld laugh. And it's 
really fun and it's a really fun situation and wow. you know b movie was that for us you know um after we wrote this script and you know, he was promoting it i was back doing my show but um you know it was still a really fun memory um flying to new york and putting that thing together i conscientious of time here you mentioned your talk show obviously i want to know I'm about still it. still good you can keep going i've got i had my son's on his way back i gotta talk to him when he comes back but he's not here I, yet I don't know anything about talk show except the few clips that I was able to find on YouTube over the years. Yes. Is this show available anywhere? How long did it run? How did you Fox get a freaking talk show? It. Like, how did this happen? They're hiding it. <clears throat> I came out of uh, Seinfeld into development. And, you know, at a certain point, I wasn't having luck creating half hours. And I wanted to get back into late night. It's, you know, I love Saturday Night Live and I loved writing about stuff and uh, that was going on. And so... I, I said to my agent, I go, let's get a late night show for Norm McDonald. And he set up a meeting with Norm and Norm wanted to go to Norm's, the breakfast place for that meeting. <clears throat> and I sat down with him and I said, you, you should have your own late night show. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah that's a great idea. And I see, see, he goes, but what's the idea? And I go, well, the idea would be you sit behind a desk like you're sitting behind and you will tell jokes and interview guests. Oh, that's that's fantastic. But what's what's the idea? And I go, it's late night. <laughs> like right now, I forget who is on. Is it, is it Leno? You would come after Leno. <laughs> I don't know if Conan was on the air yet, or I guess he was. But there was a spot open somewhere. Sure. It maybe it was maybe, maybe after Letterman. After Letterman, I'm going to get you on after Dave. Oh, I'd love to be on after Dave, but we need we need an idea. <laughs> And it, it, we just went for like an hour. I was like, oh, my God, there's no idea, Norm. And he's laughing. There's no idea. You've watched these shows. You and your comedy and your point of view are all that it takes. Yeah, Norm's um, the magic. So needless to say, yeah, okay. And we had the same uh, agent. And he's like, no, you're never going to talk Norm into this. He doesn't understand what you're talking about. So he said, you know what, Mike? Let's. I, I want to do this. I, You know, uh, if I'm being truthful to what I want to do, I've always wanted to do this job. I've been afraid to say that to anybody or the first person to say it. Let's do it. He goes, have you ever done anything? I go, yeah. I mean, I, I was on camera a lot and Saturday Night Live. And obviously, I know the writing and the producing piece of it. It seems like it could be a natural progression. And let's go out and try to sell it. Conan just did it. He was a writer. He made that jump. I think we yeah. can, you know, squeak through that door he opened. And we were able to do it with Fox. They bought the pitch. We made a pilot. Um, we shot six pilots after that. Um, Jerry was kind enough to come in as a guest. Jason Bateman came in. Um, and you know, What's I was able the to call frame? you said after Seinfeld, right? So after 98, yeah, this would be 2005, maybe 2004. Oh, wow. recently <clears throat> There's a little bit of a hiccup that took a year. All right. Where Gail Berman, who is running Fox, um, and, uh, buys the show. I make this thing. I don't know how it is. I turn it in. And I'm driving through Beverly Hills and my phone rings and it's Gail and the crew and they go, you're going to be our late night guy for Fox. Congratulations. And I almost crash into a fucking mailbox. Like it's not the reaction I thought I was going to get. I was driving my wife's Volkswagen Jetta or Passat. <laughs> no lie. Celebrate. I almost fainted. And I and and then uh, like this is amazing. You go, we can't believe how well you did. It's really great. Thank you for making us do it in the studio. And not in the, they wanted to shoot the pilot in a conference room. And I went, I don't even understand what that what? is. But That's we the idea. The Get it? <laughs> we got the best damn sports set, which gave me a desk, not unlike yours. And we, were ha we, had, a, uh, we had a great little pilot. Uh, uh, the phone rings right after that. And it's the production crew from Fox Television Studios. We're going, we're going to the Palm tonight to celebrate or tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. The Polo Lounge. We're going to the Beverly Hills. We're going to have to, wait, they're going to pick you up for like two years. I'm like, holy shit, this Whoa. is beyond anything. Don't tell anybody. And I'm like, all right, I won't tell anybody. And I'm freaking out. Three days later, Gail Berman leaves the network. <gasps> I look, I look up in variety. I'm like, oh my God. And I call CA, I go, what does this mean? They go, it's not good. It's not no. good. And then everything's on hold while we find a new network president, which ends up being Peter Liguori and Peter Chernin gets involved and all this other crew. Oh. Peter Liguori, he goes, look, I, CA says, look, I, 
I don't think you're going to survive this, right? Development from another network president, it may not be what they want to do late night. They're having trouble in prime time. Let's just see what happens. But, you know, this is just – that's TV. That's, by the way, that's just TV in a nutshell. Liguori, you know, after months, finally gets – you know, is in his office. He watches the, uh, the pilot and he goes, this is really good. <laughs> he goes, I showed it to my son. He really likes it. I want to shoot some new pilots. So, so it was about a year now where, you know, I had kind of, of course, told a couple of close friends who thought I was genuinely out of my mind. I was like, I'm going to be the Fox late night guy. They're like, yeah, sure you are. Right. And Fox isn't the evil empire it is now. It was just home of the Simpsons. It was kind of cool. And nobody put kind of Fox news together with Fox. So, and this would have been no, years after the Joan Rivers uh, that turned exactly, into Arsenio and everything. Right, they, no, so they didn't have a me. show for a long time. They had nothing. And I did six pilots, you know, and again, I heard nothing. And they said, we're going to pick you up. We're just waiting. And I, you know, met a lot of affiliates. But I go, am I picked up there yet? And they're like, no. And your, my friends are like, hey, how come I turned it on uh, late night? How come you weren't there? I thought you were the late night Fox guy. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I get, uh, you know, out of the blue, I get an invitation to come to Las Vegas with Peter and um, to meet the network affiliate groups, the individual small business owners who own the individual stations across the United States. Boston, this is the handshaking. This is the handshaking. Part, yeah. Right? And they tell me, we want you, we want you to have dinner with some of them and we just want you to meet them. They want to meet you. Um, and I go, okay. And then, you know, be funny, get up on stage. Uh, and I go, when is that going to be? He goes, it's in a casino basement on a Tuesday morning at like 7 a.m. I go, and you want me to be funny? I'm the late night guy. He goes, just get up and say something. And I go, okay. But I'm not picked up. They're like, no, just talk to them. It's a conversation. And I'm like, uh, all right. So I can't sleep the night before. I remember having dinner with the, the 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 guy who discovered Oprah Winfrey, King Syndicators, and Peter. And oh, I'm just King's World, there. sure. Yeah, King's World, and he's kind of asking me questions, and you know, I don't know anything, and, and I'm just like, I don't, I don't know what's happening it's here. Good but people I, I'm to ready talk to, to, though. I'm ready to give up on this dream, and uh, I get backstage. There's two or three hundred people there. I've I, I've not been on stage like this before, but I had written some jokes um, with one of the one of my uh, one of the writers from the pilot, and. I didn't know how I was going to present them. And Jerry gave me a great opener, which with, uh, was something like, you know, that folks, there's nothing uh, better for a late night guy than to show up on a Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. and try to make you laugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, just trust me, say that, they'll laugh. Um, and I hear Peter talking on stage uh, and he goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so here he is. Uh, we're picking him up. Uh, for a full season of his new talk show, talk show with Spike first and here Spike first. And so that's the moment. But as I'm walking on a stage, I hear the show has been picked up for a year. Talk about waiting to the even last sure. possible second. Right. And I, I mean, that is also your first lesson in how there's always a curveball before you walk on a stage, you know, as an entertainer. I, had, I don't have much experience in it, but I, all, I know one thing for sure. Whenever you walk out, something always happens right before. You can get shoved, you can be picked up, but there's always something there to throw you off and you have to pretend it didn't happen. And I went out and I told that joke and I told these seven other jokes and they crushed. They absolutely crushed. And, you know, it's one of my favorite moments of that experience. Like it, it didn't always go that way. In fact, I did that same material, uh, you know, two weeks later in a dark studio with a bunch of advertisers and I didn't get a single laugh. And that was like, holy shit, uh, that was bombing beyond belief. Um, I think it's cool that you got your talk show the same way Johnny quit his. Yeah. You know, he, he well, told the affiliates first. It just, that's sort of that I was believe just how it happened. It was the day they announced that show there was the day he died. Johnny Carson died. I mean, all sorts of weird things going on in that, at are, that place. But are you serious? Yeah, there's something I remember that day going, boy, this is all so very strange. Holy cow. And I was going to tell you, because I know you'd like this. When we were out here for the Emmys, we would go to a different Wolfgang Puck restaurant. Dave would throw a big dinner. And we were out at Granita in Malibu one night with the whole staff. And Johnny Carson walked in and just 
threw down his card and paid for the whole thing, came up to everybody's table and said hi to everybody. And, you know, congratulations. I'm very proud of this show and proud of your boss, Dave. And, you know, I want to buy you all dinner. He bought dinner for like a hundred people, you know, that's amazing. Awesome. Moment. Yeah. That's a, that's a freaking amazing. Yeah. Um, Hangar 56 media. What's going on with it? What is it? I know you've got that's, shows on the air and I went and looked us. at your website today and it's way bigger and more than I thought it would be. Yeah, well, that's just got a lot of development, and some other stuff in it. We're that's our unscripted stuff. I do a lot of scripted writing, and this is kind of the unscripted arm, um, inspired by Car Matchmaker. I like that stuff, and I work with my partner John Stevens, who created Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And oh wow, you know, it's where our reality shows, game shows, unscripted shows go in pitches, and you know, um, we're kind of just getting started with it. It's been, you know, the usual doesn't matter what you've done in life or what your resume says you've got a new entity and you're treated like one but we're having fun having fun doing it and uh you know there's a lot of good stuff coming that's all i'll say <laughs> when it's on the air i can tell you about it <laughs> yeah i hear you well it was our, my co-host on tuesdays tuesdays with tori uh actually i think you know him tori alonzo he yeah. was telling me that the justin long uh competition build show was was one of yours the one on Dis yeah Dis right. Is it disney on plus D disney plus right right that was really yeah, fun. congratulations that was, that's wonderful thank you yeah we had a good time that was a uh, richard rollins from fast and loud pitched us that idea he You're said kidding. i want to do a competition show we were meeting Woo! with him about some car thing right because what I really want to do is shop teachers competing to see who's the best shop teacher with their students. And we went, you know what? That's a damn good idea. I haven't seen anything like that. He goes, yeah. He goes, think of all the, the building that's going on in China. Why can't we get people proud to build things in here in the United States? Um, and we took it into Disney Plus and they picked it up right to series. So we were, you know, really happy about it. That's awesome, Spike. Uh, yeah, what's yeah. what's coming fun. up for you? Your 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 Spike's Car Radio is huge. It's blowing up. The only complaint I have is that there's no video. How can we get videos? Yeah, we're going to do then? that. You're going to do it. You're going to build us a studio. Okay. <laughs> awesome. This whole COVID-19 is. I really like, you did Matt's studio, right? The Smoky yeah. Tire? How, how, what did you think the other day? It's wonderful. Awesome. I was jealous. It's really okay. nice. <laughs> but in this time of COVID-related illness um, and my lack of kind of personal time to do this show, um, I've kind of been enjoying just having my guests over Zoom and, and getting the show done quickly that way. I will pay more attention to it, but when are you posting this, this episode? Um, well, this will this now has a little bit more work than it sh ordinarily should have. But It'll be week? up later tonight. Okay, then, you know, here's what I'll say. This Sunday, we're going to be out at Bill's at the Malibu Cars and uh, Coffee, Malibu Kitchen Cars and Coffee. Yep. Um, if the parking lot is uh, roped off, bring your scissors, just cut it and just drive on in. Uh, oh, yes, we're talking about that. <laughs> they can't stop you from parking there. Just go there. Um, and I'm going to be there with the folks from Porsche Subscription and Porsche Rental um, doing a special promotion with them. They're going to have three cars out there. Um, and we'll have some of our Porsches and we're helping them launch the Los Angeles uh, Porsche subscription, which is you download the app <clears throat> and you can get a 911 for one month. You can get a multi vehicle service where you can trade cars every week and drive a bunch of different cars. Insurance is included. <clears throat> they also just have like a that's not the deal a there. Insurance is included. Deal. That's major, major. Yeah, and then they have a basic rental. So say you're flying out from another place, you can now use this app. And I, I downloaded it, and I was up and running in about 45 seconds. You can Se get a Porsche seriously? 911 to go. Yeah, you get a new 911 to go bang around in canyons for like hundreds of dollars, as opposed to what you might rent them for at, in Beverly Hills, you know, car rentals. So it's a pretty exciting program. Um, and uh, they're going to be out there. I'm going to be out there with them, and we're going to meet the guy. Apparently, there's a kid in the organization who kind of came up with the idea, and they said, let's do it. Um, oh, of so course. Yeah, a kid Sunday. comes up with the app, right? Of course. No, I think with the idea, I don't know, and we'll get into it, but I suspect it's, you know, T uh, Turo, you know, that cool company that rents you cool cars, that Porsche saw this opportunity for not you know three-year leases this is something you can do if you're bi-coastal you come out in september you go get, get me a 911 they drop it off in your driveway and when you're done uh, in october they take it back and you Oof, only pay for the smart. month they cover the insurance smart. they they take care of all of it right and you know um 
well, you know, that's an amazing deal. That's something I would have done if we were doing our LA shows. I would have said, great, send me a 911 for two weeks. And when I leave, take it back. Right? Who doesn't want that? Sounds good to me. So you, Zuckerman, and what, Matt Farah? Zuckerman and I will just be out there kind of uh, doing play-by-play on the car show. Oh, and good. all the okay. nonsense that goes on with that. And then we're going to talk to the folks from Porsche and hear about this uh, new program. Awesome. And that'll uh, probably go up next week. But you should, uh, if you're go in the LA area and you want to check it out live, come on down to Bill's on Sunday. Yeah, come down and hang out. But wear a mask like Jay does when he comes. Social distance. <laughs> But That's exactly right. I keep help mine with me, me at all times. Help in me fact, it's a great time to cones. say, if you're in a place of the, where you should be wearing a mask and you see somebody who isn't, you could say to them, hey, man, need a mask? Shophansiger.com. That's what we did. There you go. Spike, thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. I really appreciate you sticking with it. Um, I hope that we get to do this again, uh, and I certainly will see you Sunday. But thank you very, very much for your time. I got a couple questions I always wanted to, the answers to. I got those answered. And, uh, and I feel like, um, I feel like I got to know you a little bit better and I really appreciate that. All right. And I'm going to leave you with this challenge. See if you can steal this microphone from me. Ah! Just try, (laughs) just try it. (laughs) You don't, this is dangerous. dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much, Spike Ferriston. Take care. See you Sunday. Awesome. Uh, Spike Ferriston. That was very, that was really fun. All right. Let's see for the rest of this. Um, it's Thursday and, uh, we have a little bit of extra time. So I'm going to play a TBT. The Hills, as we, uh, as we, we showed you last week, I'm going to play, uh, I'm going to play this video real quick. It's just a couple seconds. Yeah, that was from last week where we ended up doing the Breakfast Club um, because, uh, you know, the road was closed because of the fires. Apparently that whole area has been burned where we are, where we where we currently are right there. Apparently was a crossing section. Uh, so it has skipped. There's a lot of stuff going on down there. It's not great. Uh, we will not, not, not be at Breakfast Club tomorrow, not at Newcomb's, not on Angeles Crest or the surrounding highways. Uh, and I recommend that you all stay off too. Obviously, do whatever you want. It's a free country. Um, but given the uh, current situation, we thought it would be best to just uh, not give our agencies who are out there battling this place the room that they need. Also, completely unrelated, shout out to TLG. <laughs> We're taking this opportunity of not having a breakfast club to uh, get Yellow Car a little bit of TLC. Uh, we're getting, uh, I don't know exactly what's happening, but obviously you can see it's suspension work. I see a, a bunch of Barts on the ground and I, I see what looks like uh, some sort of uh, uh, <laughs> anti-roll bar, <laughs> a bunch of other stuff. I don't know what's going on. It's awesome. Marco's taking care of it, but uh, we will not, not, not be at Breakfast Club tomorrow. Um, very quickly, TBT, and I think we'll leave you there. I got a couple announcements to make before we leave and then that's it. Roll it, Hal. Thanks so much. This is why I did not clean the car today. Giving it a go. We made it up here. It was not easy. <laughs> but some career fours made it up as well. There's uh, Aaron and Ron. 
totes my gold is down there. Bonnie made it up. And a bunch of trucks and four-wheel drive. I'm just trying to get the other one out. Yeah, right. See how much further. Awesome breakfast club. It was White Friday. And not how that in the good way, in the beautiful, snowy, it's Black Friday for everybody else. It sounds awful. Uh, we're leaving Newcombs. It was uh, awesome. Can't believe that there was actually a turnout. Seven Porsches, eight Porsches, something like that. Uh, we're going to get out of here and try to get out safely. The roads are not good. See you down there. In fact, that's probably why we're stopped. Hi, Mrs. Ryan. Right. Uh, we can't exactly see. Maybe you can see. And it Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's snowing. Uh, well, what are you going to do? All right. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for hanging out with the technical difficulties, Spike Ferriston. Uh, we love everybody at home. Please love one another. We will be back on Tuesday with Tori. We're going to find out what's going on with Cobra Kai. And he bought a car. He bought a car. We're going to talk all about it. See you next week.